call this meeting to order at 5.40 p.m. And now is the time for public comment for things which are not already on the agenda. So, yeah, yeah there you go. Um, so I, I can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. This is Libby, yeah. Sorry. I'm in Waterbury and there's a lot of construction here. I'm sitting in my car. Um, so just wanted to give an update on happenings at the library. Um, the Friends of Kimball Library Bookshop has moved to a new location. It's on 28 Pleasant Street. Um, and the shops open on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. All the um, proceeds go to Kimball. Um, we also have a new Tiny Table podcast episode. And uh, we're launching a journaling project, a community journaling project, where um, there's going to be a workshop on September 11th um, that folks can sign up for by reaching out to Lynn at the library. Um, and it's going to be like a daily journaling project during these tumultuous times for the community. Um, the downstairs restroom is under construction for the next three weeks to bring it up to um, ADA requirements. And uh, we just still have the limited open hours side door for browsing and we're open on Mondays and Thursdays for that from 11 to six. Um, and then at the door services continue. Um, with the hours on the website and you can do that at the door services from the front area, the front door of the library. Um, I think that is it. Are there any questions? Not for me. Oh, I'm good. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Libby. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to a uh, quick reminder to everyone that I uh, have just hit record. And so you may see a notice on your screen that the meeting is being recorded. And no Orca this time? Uh, yes, the uh, screen box named Adam B is from Orca, but I'm not oh. sure if they are recording on their end or not. So I just would rather be safe than sorry and record. Okay, great. Um, other other public comment? Okay, hearing I'm going to sign off, but I just wanted to say I'm sorry to hear about your resignation, Adolfo, and thank oh. you for all the work you've done here. Thank you, Libby. I appreciate it. Very kind. Thank you very right. much. Hope, hope you all take care. Thank you. Sorry, I got to go. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Okay, hearing no other public comment, we'll move on to approval of the agenda. I move the approval of the uh, agenda as, uh, as stated. Okay. okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes. <clears throat> Move on to the consent calendar. Now, uh, the first part of the, the, the consent calendar is the meeting minutes from both August 13th, our regular meeting, and the September 3rd special meeting from last week. Um, we also have warrants um, that need to be approved. You can Larry, do I have a correction on uh, September 3rd minutes. Okay, what's up, Pat? Uh, public attendees, I know there was at least Marty Strange was there and it talks about him later on. And was Sonny Holt there? I don't know. Yeah, I think he that. was there briefly. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, Sonny was there for a little while. So Marty and Sonny should be in the public attendees. Okay. I will. I'm Way taking back. note. Thank you, Pat. I'm taking note of that now, uh, and we'll make the adjustments on the on the minutes. Thanks, Pat. Good catch, Pat. Thank you. Yep.
Any other questions or comments? Move to approve about? the consent calendar. I second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes and we'll move on to new business. <clears throat> First place of new business is a tax warrant. Um, would you like to tell us about that, Adolfo? Uh, yes, the tax warrant in your packets is uh, the annual process where um, uh, the first document is a document issued by the clerk's office. It's just authorizing the clerk's office to send out tax bills. Um, I'm trying to look at the actual title of that document. Um, Oh, it's hmm. It should forget the title of it, but uh, yes, it's um, where is it? Oh, here we go. It is a PDF document, uh, it's an action item sheet, and it is to essentially grant the clerk the authority to commence taxing residents of the town uh, for their property tax. Actually, it approves the tax collector, right? So it wouldn't necessarily be the clerk, isn't that what you said? Correct, yeah, tax collector, you're correct, yes. I read your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, to, to Pat's point, uh, he is correct. It is a tax collector. Uh, it is part of the annual statutory process. Um, it's something that we, that the select board would have to authorize before the clerk can perform, I'm sorry, not the clerk, but the tax collector can perform their statutory uh, duties to collect tax. Uh, move, we approve the tax warrant. Second it. We have a motion and a second to approve the tax warrant. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Move on to property in town of Bethel. Don't we have to do the approve the uh, tax rates too? Yes, there's also uh, the tax rate in your packet. Um, the tax rate has been set by um, by the listers now that they've received all the information issued by the state. Uh, it is a document in your packet titled FY21 tax rates. Uh, and it'll show what the municipal rate is at the very top of the list um, in bold. It will also show what the rate is uh, for the police district and the rate uh, for local agreements. And then on page two, it will show the total townwide tax rate uh, when you start calculating in the state uh, portion. What do we so need here? Motion to approve the tax rates? Yes, please. So moved. Uh, before we, yeah, well, before we, before we do that, I just have a question. Um, obviously, we need to do this, but um, my understanding now, this is this is based upon the the budget, right? That we are that we have already passed. Yeah. And it's, and it's based upon the value of the property in the town. So. You know, we've, we've, I guess what I'm saying is like, this is the seat, like, what would happen if we said, oh, actually, we, we don't like this? What would we, what would we do? We'd have to go back and change the budget so that we could say, oh my goodness, wait, we didn't mean to make the tax rates be what they are. Yeah. And so I'm sort of thinking like, why are we doing this now kind of thing? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Much of it is, um, 
it, 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 it does require a local approval. However, it is a state process. So the state essentially is granting municipalities the right to approve the tax rate. However, it is a state requirement. So it's almost like a just checking boxes because we have to do it anyway. And if the select board chooses to not approve the tax rate, then it would create a problem locally because essentially if we did not, if the select board chose to not approve the tax rate and then also chose to not authorize a tax collector to collect taxes, the state would still collect its state component uh, and would force the town to collect the state component of it um, and would probably throw its hands up and say, well, you probably should collect the local tax rate as well to fill the local obligations. Um, but we probably would be sued by the state so that we fulfill the statute requirements and then send the money along to the state. It is, it is a, um, I, yeah, it's one of those checking boxes that the state forces municipal governments to go through. Mm -hmm. It's essentially confirming, reconfirming what the local rate is that we've shared with them. And then also saying that the town accepts the state rate that they are then sharing with the town. Okay. Yeah, I guess just, just maybe, maybe. Larry, Larry. Yeah, Pat. In actual fact, it's they have somebody to blame now because we voted on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, of course. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, well, uh, moving on, we have a motion and a second. I don't think we have a second yet, but we I'll didn't, second. I thought I heard a second. Uh, I did. Uh, oh, you did, Pat. Thanks. Yep. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank the listeners for their efforts. Yep. Uh, if I may, I can point out that we've, we've had, uh, I believe, Trini log in. I see that. She's muted right now. I am here, Adolfo. Hi, Trini. <laughs> <laughs> you want you want to take over, Trini? Uh, no, go ahead, Larry. I'm uh, in the vehicle. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to property in town of Bethel then. Uh, yes. Uh, Approximately two years ago, two town meetings ago, uh, we had asked the uh, residents of Randolph to grant the authority to the town to either sell or transfer the property that the town owns in Bethel. Um, the information that we had shared with the voters was that we are paying property tax to residents in Bethel and then also, I'm sorry, to the town of Bethel. Um, and also, um, I don't recall if we did or not, but communication from the town's attorney to the, the town of Randolph was that it was not a good idea for one town to own property in another town. So two town meetings ago, the voters authorized the town to sell uh, or transfer the property. Um, I, I don't recall if transfer was there, but it, uh, sale was there, but there was no amount. Um, and at this point, um, we have a local nonprofit that uh, operates uh, kids camps and then also young teen camps. And they have expressed the desire to take possession of the property whole, uh, which would then eliminate the town's liability over the property. We would essentially be, it could be sold slash transferred for a dollar onto the nonprofit in Randolph. <clears throat> so there's there's been a lot of talk about the the sort of the obligations of the town because of the way this property was given to the town um, to it being used by a boys group. Um, is is your thinking that this group would satisfy that obligation? Uh, yes, it would. Um, the you're right, Larry. What specifically mentioned in the deed was that. 
the town can uh, sell or I don't recall the specific words. I think it was like get rid of, and you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. If there was no boy, uh, boy scout or similar boy organization in the town and that the property became a financial liability to the town. Uh, the property is a financial liability to the town because we pay the taxes and pay to insure it. Um, and also there is currently no boy scout group within Randolph, um, but there is a group that does operate a similar type of um, camps for youth within Randolph. And I believe they also have kids from outside of Randolph come to the camps, but uh, it, it, it does include kids from Randolph. Mm -hmm. who, who would be um, allowed to attend these, this camp that would want to operate out of this space? It sounds like it's through a church. Would this be only open to people affiliated with the church? Uh, it would be not necessarily affiliated with the church, but affiliated with the nonprofit. Um, so they are a technical nonprofit. They do offer the camps. I don't recall, you know, I'd have to ask them again if they'd have to have membership to the church or if the, the events are open to everyone. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head, but I, I do know that they would fit the requirement um, in the deed. Mm -hmm. Adolfo, uh, they do allow kids from outside of their organization at their camps. Okay. Thank you, Trini. Uh, this is Pat. I have uh, two comments. The first one being that I believe the Boy Scouts have reorganized in the state and have a new plan of how they're running everything. And I think it would be worthwhile to check with them again to see if they have an interest in this property. So can uh, I answer that, Pat? Uh, the Boy Scouts, the folks that were running the Randolph group and the Sharon group have all been at the table for these discussions. And the Sharon Boy Scout troop is actually affiliated with this group. So it will still be available to the Boy Scouts. The statewide organization has repeatedly said they have zero interest in owning property. Have they said that recently? Yes. When? I mean, within with, the last month or two? Within the last, within, I can confirm that I had a meeting with them personally over a year ago. And within the last 12 months, I sent them a letter um, informing them of the previous offer and informing them that they had declined accepting the property and informing them that if they insisted on using town property that they had to coordinate use with the town otherwise it would be considered trespassing and insurance coverage would be a problem because it was an unauthorized group on town property. Uh, the letter went um, with, I didn't get a response from them I called the Boy Scouts again six months after I sent the letter to inquire on whether or not they received the letter and asked them to call me so that we can discuss the property and they did not call me back. So every communication that I've had with the Boy Scouts was driving the same message home to the town that they do not want the property. They have an, they have an excess amount of property already and we're working to deal with that. Um, so, you know, on multiple occasions, they have driven the message home to me and to the town that they do not want the property. Was that recent as of this spring or summer? Uh, it's within the last six months that I that I attempted to reestablish communication with them. And the only thing I can surmise from their lack of interest in speaking with me is that they're just not interested in, in the property. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, everyone, but I believe the Boy Scouts of America within the last six months as a national organization have filed for bankruptcy. Um, I believe that to be the case and that suggests that um, if, if, if that sort of financial uh, condition filters down the line to the state affiliates, uh, I doubt the state affiliate is in a position to even consider this now if they wanted to. Um, 
<clears throat> that's right, Tom. And on top of that, this group that's willing to take on the responsibility has is works with the Boy Scouts. So it actually gets the camp more use by other youth groups than just the Boy Scouts. Okay. And, so, and Trini, did you say it would be open to anybody that wanted to use it as long as they were doing it responsibly? Well, I don't know that it's just going to be open to anybody that wants to use it. I think it's going to be under the same conditions. I mean, they're we're at this this is getting it out from under the town and so they're going to have to work with this group if they want to use it. You know, I don't think it's fair for us to say set that kind of condition on it. You know, if I, I, Trini, if I may add um, uh, additional information, I think one of the challenges that and, and it was briefly touched on by our attorney over two years ago of why one town should not own property in another town. Um, is not necessarily just the financial liability, but also just the insurance liability. Um, over the last, over my tenure with the town, I received calls from neighbors of our property there saying that, that they hear people on the property, they hear parties happening on the property, uh, they don't know what's happening there, they occasionally hear gunshots, they don't know if it's hunting or if people are there on Randolph's property shooting. Um, we can't have a staff member at that lot controlling who does and does not enter. So it's not just a financial liability now, but also an insurance liability uh, in, in keeping it under the town's umbrella um, is from my perspective, just to, to share with the board, it, it, it may not be a good idea to do so, especially if we now have a group within Randolph that will use it and we'll make it available to Randolph people, um, it, it would get rid of the financial and insurance liability from the town and still service Randolph residents. With that, I'd make a motion that we authorize Adolfo to complete the transfer of this property. I think before we do that, we need to talk about the condition uh, the condition that Adolfo put as an example about selling the property. Um, right now, Adolfo's example, which it sounds like we are free to uh, use a user or come up with something different, is, um, is that the property shouldn't be sold within 10 years. And if it was to be sold within 10 years, the town would receive 75% of the revenue generated by the sale. Um, I, I think that's a good starting point. I, my inclination would be to make that period of time longer. Um, I'd like to, um, since we're basically, you know, giving it away and I would like to, I would not like to see a private organization, you know, profit in a significant way from the, us, you know, bequeathing them this property. Um, just to be clear, once it's transferred at whatever a dollar or whatever minimal amount we might, um, does the covenant that it be used only for use, I mean, historically it's said by boys, but let's say youths in this case, um, does that go away with the transfer of the deed to the East Randolph Baptist Church? No, it's on the deed. Okay. Yeah. So they could only sell it to a youth service organization, regardless of what time frame they sold it within. Is that accurate? That is the same as the same condition that we have. Mm -hmm. Right, right, exactly. It would have to be in the new deed, though. It travels with the deed. It would have to be uh, in the new deed to be enforceable. Uh, so, so to that end. Um, does the gender identity boy um, carry forward with uh, that, this transaction as well? Uh, uh, that is an issue um, that, that did come up in my conversations with our attorney uh, before we brought it to the uh, town meeting for a vote. Um, this is not uncommon when you have 
long-standing deeds with these types of conditions where they're just not they're just not what they should be in current times and so our attorney had previously understood that even if it does specifically say boy organization that a legal proceeding would not violate law by you know uh, not including protected you know classes like you know on gender and everything else so those old deeds as they come up would be updated to include all genders. So, uh, so even though it does say boy, similar boy organizations, uh, the deeds themselves would be updated to be more, more inclusive and more uh, in, in accordance with current law. So it might, for example, just refer to youth yeah. rather than, no. okay. The tree is correct. The restrictions move forward. They, they just don't disappear. Uh, well, to that end, then I, I, I'm comfortable with leaving it at the 10. Um, I personally am comfortable leaving it at the 10 year um, time period cap. Um, uh, uh, 10 years from now, the likelihood of, who knows, another youth organization stepping up and offering a substance to quality, uh, quantity, excuse me, of money for this property is, seems to me fairly relatively remote. Um, and I think- well, if, we're, if we're transferring it for a dollar and when they transfer it for a dollar, you're gonna get 75 cents. Right, right. What's and, it doesn't I think the matter to me if as long as it stays in some form of, you know, youth uh, yeah. entity, you know, I'm fine with it if it got transferred along as that was part of the covenant of the deed. So it doesn't matter to me what they sell it for. If they were able to move it forward and could continue those type of programs, I'd be fine with it. Yeah, same here. Um, and that's why I wanted to be sure that the covenant was remaining in the deed, because if somehow they found a way to sell it as a you know, residential building lot further down the line, I'd be a heck of a lot more concerned about it. But as long as it's going to remain in the service of um, youths in the region uh, in perpetuity, I think we're, I think we can be reasonably assured that it is not going to be transferred for a substantive amount of money that's going to put us at a disadvantage. If it's helpful um, to Trini's motion, uh, for me to complete the transfer, I could speak with uh, with the the group that's willing to take possession of the property. Uh, when I did speak with them already, they were they were open to it. They 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 just yeah. want to continue to serve um, the, the populations that they already serve. Right. So I don't think that they would object at all to if for some reason the covenants don't transfer, which I I firmly believe they do. But if they don't, we could just modernize the language to say, you know, to, to use of, of Randolph and in, including other youths. They do transfer, otherwise we would have been able to sell this for residential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and uh, it's taken us two years just to find anybody willing to come to the table and play this role. So I don't believe they're gonna have anybody knocking on their door to take this over. I don't think they want them to, to tell you the truth. They're, they're planning all kinds of things with their programs for the youth around this. I, I, I agree. I, I, over the years, I've heard that they do operate well-attended youth camps, uh, Randolph, uh, students to participate in them. Um, so I, I have no doubt that they would use the property for what it was intended. So I, I must confess, I'm not familiar with the property or never set foot on it. Um, are there outbuildings or uh, ancillary structures there that are part of the camp? Um, you know, no. Yeah. No? There is one, there is one building. One building and then there's an outhouse. The one building that's there um, has seen better days. Uh, mm -hmm. The photographs in the deed, uh, which I believe were taken in 1942, uh, uh, are of the same building. 
It's been updated a little bit here and there, but it's for the most part the same building. Okay. Um, so I want to be clear as to who we're transferring this to, because um, it says in your in your notes, Adolfo, that it's a group that operates sort of underneath the umbrella of the East Randolph Baptist Church. Uh, it is actually, and I'm sorry, I may have miswritten that. Uh, it is actually the nonprofit the East uh, Randolph Baptist Church. That is so, the uh, the name of the nonprofit organization. Okay, so the East Randolph Baptist Church is the group, is the nonprofit, and they run a camp that they would like to have use this this, this property. Yes, but but they will also they will also control or access to it by other youth groups. Um, is that, I guess, I guess to give you an example, if an LGBTQ youth group wanted to have a summer camp at the East Baptist, uh, East Randolph Baptist Community Church's property that we're transferring to them, um, would they automatically grant access to that? I don't want to get into a theological discussion here, but I just want to make sure that all youths of all gender identities and all persuasions, whatever you want to call it, are going to have access to this and they're not going to be proscribed by the occupants of the... Yeah, what, once the property is transferred, it would be it would be owned by the group and they would set um, use parameters. The, the town would be completely out of it. It's not the town's property anymore. Okay. Yeah. They would control scheduling and- I mean, um, right. it, yeah. not that it's gonna be any different than the Boy Scouts. They don't exactly have a track, strong track record of um, equitable programming, but yeah. anyway, I just, you know, I, I, I kind of hear That's a little me. bit of what Larry's speaking yeah. to. Yeah. Um. I mean, my, my concern would just be that, you know, there'd be people in the community who might like to attend a camp at that property. And if it's run by a church, um, that that might not, you know, be a thing, you know, or if yep. you're not a part of that church, are you going to feel welcome joining a group that, that uses that property? It, it's, it seems a little more exclusive than I mean, and I agree, Tom, the Boy Scouts have had issues, which, which I think are highly problematic, um, but it does seem even more exclusive than, than something like the Boy Scouts. Yeah. I can't I say can... we, we currently do not have, the town does not, and I don't see it having the capacity moving forward to, to, to operate a camp for Randolph residents in Bethel. Um, and I, and I understand the concern and I understand the points that are being raised. I think the challenge that, that I see for the town is that we just, it's challenging enough for us to operate and have activities here within the town boundaries, let alone on a property that is well outside the town boundaries. And it's, it's in a fairly remote road. Once you get there, you're really away. And the greater liability is that we, we just, it's, it's a large lot with the, you know, as unmaintained a driveway as it is, folks have learned that no one is on that lot. And we don't have the ability to be on that lot to control who's there, what they're doing. Um, and so I, I understand the points that are being raised for essentially, you know, wanting to, from, from my understanding, potentially not give it to or transfer it to the uh, East Randolph Baptist Church. But the liability that the town will continue to incur is far greater. Um, so, you know, I'm just, I'm advising the board to, that this is a good way to remove the liability from the town and give it to a group that already is servicing Randolph residents. I think the other point to make Adolfo is it hasn't had any use for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. So no youth, no matter who they are, are benefiting from it right now. And instead, we've got a vacant parcel that is has no value, just has a drain on our limited resources. So, you know, the the Boy Scouts haven't even been using it 
and we've got an organization willing to step up and try to create some programming um, that'll not, you know, they'll they'll bring it back to life. Wouldn't surprise me if they build a whole new structure and all kinds of stuff there. But, um, you know, I I don't believe we're meeting the intent of of the person that left the property to the town by just letting it sit there either. No, that's absolutely true. And we've got nobody else. As much as we've shaken the trees and pushed and prodded, we have nobody else that has stepped forward to, huh? to take this on. How many acres is the parcel? I believe it's uh, 20 acres, Whoa. 19 to 20 acres, yeah. It is a, it's a, it's a wow. wooded area. There's a, you know, it's hilly for most of it, but there is roughly flat buildable land on, you know, I, I, I'd say maybe one or I, two acres of it. Mm. Some of it also crosses um, uh, the road. So it's on the opposite side and it covers the stream. So it, you can't really do anything there other than to t potentially fish and, and walk by the river or the stream. Doesn't sound like it would, it, it, it's property that would be amenable, for example, to the installation of a trail network through there, would it? If it's mostly mountainous and hilly, um, well, I mean it. Like everywhere else around here. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I, um, I, and I, Tom, I see where you're going with that. I think the challenge would then be, would be a Bethel project. And I don't know if, how you know amenable they would be to. Well, there is one, I mean, I don't want to throw, a, I really do not want to throw a wrench into the works at the very last minute here. Um, but there is at least one statewide organiz youth organization that I can think of that might find this product project uh, or this property attractive and that's the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. Um, it, it's, a, it's a long shot, um, but it's, it's a non-sectarian um, uh, and, and, and more inclusive um, youth service organization that is specifically focused on environmental protection trail net building trail networks they they have summer programs where kids are working in state parks maintaining trail networks it's um it's an outstanding organization i you know i i don't know whether it, it merits approaching them or not but um we've, i just put it out a, there you know we've we've been doing this for a long time we're not under a time pressure. It's not like anybody's going to use it this season. I don't see where it would hurt to make that inquiry and then bring this up again at our next meeting. So how do we then decide who gets it? I mean, we haven't, I, you know, I haven't seen anybody out there trying to drum up other organizations. And now we've got one that's just spent a fair amount of time uh, and incurred some legal expenses is ready to step up and move this into production. And we're, we're basically saying, we're not really interested. We wanna find somebody else. And these people are also community members. I mean, this is, this is a big group of community people. members. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a good point. I, 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 think, I, will I, think, that. I think it's wrong to go offer this to some other community or some other entity when you have an active group of people right here in our own community who are looking after the best interest of the children that they're working with. Okay. So I, mean, I know these people personally, you know, I just sold them a tent so they could, you know, use that to do the same kind of program here. And, you know, I think they're looking to expand their offerings. And I think this is a good opportunity for them. And the intent of the original uh, covenant in the original deed was, in addition to being, you know, relative to boys, it was specific to boys from this community. Is that uh, yes, the deed specifically mentioned uh, the Randolph Boy Scouts okay. for a similar organization. So yeah, well, yeah, the intent was really for Randolph residents. Right. Well, that goes to Perry's point as well. Mm -hmm. Well stated then. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't clear that it was that specific. Uh,
just to comment from my point of view, I feel uncomfortable with the, what the wording might be in the deed. Um, I would like to see who is interested at this point and then have it come up at town meeting. That would be my preference. Who, uh, who is interested, Pat? What, what do you mean, who is interested and how does that relate to the wording? I'm not quite sure your point. Well, they're separate issues, but I would want to make sure that access was going to be open to all youth, the issue that you mentioned. Right. And I would want to, I still question whether the Boy Scouts, since they're reorganizing, might have an interest. And I think they've been through enough issues, so they're going to be open to everybody. Um, this other group that you've mentioned is a worthwhile group. Um, I know of then I'd rather have the people of the town decide who they're going to give this property. You know, Pat, I can I can hear you on that, but the uh, we already had this discussion at town meeting, and the vote was for the select board to find an entity and transfer it. Yes. And yes. you know, uh, the it's fairly specific to Randolph Youth, and I'm not sure that the conservation folks have you know, just Randolph youth. No, not at, all. That, not at all. You know, this group that's that's looking at it has a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, movers and shakers in this town that's associated with this church and uh, a fair amount of financial backing to actually make it something that brings a huge benefit to the youth. They're very committed to giving them uh, activities and places to go and things to do there. You know, I've seen them take a lot of kids that are in some pretty rough households and make success cases out of them. Uh, and this, in my opinion, is one more asset that could really help them continue to reach those goals. And I'm not, um, I'm comfortable with, with the authorized in the transfer tonight because I've seen what they're able to do. You believe the access will be open to all? I have not had that conversation with them. So I don't know if the religious side of it brings anything to the table for them, but I have seen them open their doors at the church to everybody. I think the, if I could add, um, not specifically to Pat's comment about open to all, I think the town has, uh, looking at it from a very black and white perspective, has already met its obligation where the property was held by the town, the taxes were paid by the town, and the property had been used by the Randolph Boy Scouts throughout their existence. Boy Scouts of Randolph no longer exist. Um, the state Boy Scouts entity has, is refused to take in the property. We have advertised and, and the select board has spoken about this topic in public at not just select board meetings, but also during town meeting. And the result was that the taxpayers of Randolph want to gave the select board the authority to just get rid of the property. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but um, and I think at this point, the voters have expressed to the select board their willingness to remove the liability, both financial and insurance, um, from the local taxpayers and essentially get rid of the property. I do feel that the town has performed its due diligence in trying to seek someone who would take the property to fulfill the obligations in the deed. Um, we have had very limited success over at least my three years and also my predecessor, the fact that we still have the property um, has proven that it's been a challenge to get rid of it. So, you know, now that we have someone who's willing to bring life to it, willing to continue to meet the obligations by serving Randolph youth, um, I think it would, I think it would be more of a violation of the public's trust to not give it to a group that wants to continue to fulfill the obligations in the deed.
Okay. Adolfo, do you know if at any point in um, the course of these um, discussions over the last 18 months, two years, whatever it's been, um, has there been any discussion with Rasta about whether they might be interested in this camp as part of their trail network and potentially as part of a youth uh, mountain biking and, and trail uh, maintenance program? I'm just I, have, I have not, um, but I do know that Rasta's trails, or at least the trails that run through Randolph, run through private property. So right. even if the property was given or transferred to the East Bethel Baptist Church, they can work directly with Rasta and allow trails, bike trails to be a part of, of the property okay. itself. So, right. Right. so transferring the property to private ownership would not eliminate it from having these types of trails on, on the property. Yeah, I'm not sure Rasta has the bandwidth to take on that right now. Yeah, I, 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 they're, they're taking on a lot. I know. I'm just, I'm trying to think creatively here, um, and I don't mean. Well, and, and I think that any, yeah, I mean, I just think anybody could collaborate with the church. I mean, I think that, I mean, I don't feel that given the amount of time that we've spent on this topic, you now have somebody who's willing to, you know, to move it along and like, you know, somebody said, you know, breathe some new life into it. I don't think that's going to be meaning it's an exclusive and, you know, you're not going to be seeing some coordinated efforts with other entities like Rasta or some, I mean, the property could end up, you know, they could end up developing the property and possibly lease it to, you know, some group for the week. I mean, this is what happens to a lot of camps. I just did an event yeah. oh, absolutely. For, a, for, a Jewish, for a Jewish boys camp over in New Hampshire because they couldn't use one in Vermont. So they leased one from New Hampshire. You know, yeah. I think there's lots of opportunities that if somebody was to market it, I mean, it could be used for lots of different things. No, no, I, I, I don't have, I don't, I don't question anything that Trini or you have said previously about what this particular group has done for some youths in our town um, by any stretch of the imagination. I just want to be sure that, or try to be sure that this property is available to yeah, I get it. As many, as many people use. as possible. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, you know, Absolutely. I think you'll find, my belief is that, like I said, I've worked with this group myself before. I've sold them tents. I've given, I've donated tents to them. You know, they're very active, as Trini said. And, and I find them to be very, very open to a lot of stuff. So, you know, they struggled in the beginning. You know, back when the COVID head thing hit me, they, they hit us. They were trying to figure out how they could hurt, have church services. I mean, they've got a big following and a big group and they solve problems and they do things. So, you know, Marty Bascom, who is in charge of this, is an excellent guy who's doing a tremendous amount of work with that church. There are actually two churches involved here. So, you know, they, he's works with a, with a Royalton group. He works with this Randolph group. So I, I think you'll find that it would be well served, in my opinion. They would probably, like Trini said, they, you think they would actually make some investment in the property and, and bring it to, you know, bring it to life. Okay. And I think it'll serve the community. That's the thing. I'm mean, not so not so believing that, you know, if you were to give it to the Conservation Corps or something like that, you know, I don't know how that's really going to benefit a lot of folks in the community. Yeah. I think this, this group yeah. has an opportunity to reach out and provide more, you know, more outreach within the community than an organization like that. Yeah. Perry, is the group in Royalton, is that Boy Scouts or is that another? No, no, that's, that's part of this church group. Marty, Marty works the two, Marty has the two churches. Okay. So, and that's why I think it might involve more youth in the region. I mean, I don't think it's just Randolph. I think there's an opportunity for them to, to do programs that involve, you know, Brookfield, Braintree, Randolph kids, probably Bethel, maybe Royalton kids. So I, I think they will do an excellent job with it. That's my personal opinion. Any other comments? Question, what's the deed going to have on it for restrictions? Same ones that are there now, Pat. That'll be transferred to the new deed. If, except Adolfo said earlier that 
the attorney advise that, for example, reference to boy would be changed to use, or am I misunderstanding that? I think that's what I heard. Yeah, yeah. no, you, you're both correct. I, I would work with attorneys for the transfer and we could we would modernize the language so that it's not in violation of a protected class. And, and on that note, who would challenge that? I mean, would we get anything from boys to youths? You mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, Nobody yeah, is challenging yeah, that. So, no. I don't but, think uh, anybody would challenge that. So, yeah. So I, I just, you know, I think you just make that change, and I think that gets us to the to the the goal that we want to see here is, you know, off the town's uh, sheet and onto moving something productive and possibly some really future good stuff coming from it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it sounds like we're ready for a motion. May I jump in here for a quick minute, please? This is Dave Crosby. Sure, Dave. I'm looking at the town report from a couple of years ago when this issue came up, and at town meeting, the voters voted to change the term boy organization to youth organization. The town approved that on a voice vote at uh, town meeting. Well, that's helpful, Dave, thank you. That goes to the, my one of my concerns. Um, yeah, we don't need to, we don't, you know, to me, we don't need to go over that again. Right. Right. Yeah. It also, okay. I'm it, also it also suggests that, um, any youth organization that applies to use the property, regardless of who holds the deed, should be granted access. I don't think I want to be in the position of policing that. Yeah, well, that, mm. that would be a challenge. Yeah. I think what we're trying to do is get out from under this. Right. Yeah. So I can, if, if there is a motion from the board, uh, I would ensure that the restrictions that had previously been issued by the Randolph voters, which is change boy organization to youth organization, work well with our attorneys during the transfer. Yeah. So the way it'll be written will be that it'll have to remain the youth. Um, project that can't be sold, right? To a non-youth oriented organization. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't there, if there was no organization, then it could be sold? Yes, that's correct. So if it, if if it is, if there's no, um, current language is no boy, but if we just switch boy to youth, it would be no youth organization uh, and if it becomes a financial liability, then it can be sold. So we were on the verge of putting it out to anybody who wanted to buy it, at which point there would have been no restrictions whatsoever on the deed, and it would have been gone to whatever use, use the buyer wanted, correct? Yep. Well, what is the assessed value of the parcel? Uh, I believe it is the land value itself. I, I have to look through my files. Let me get here. that number for you. The number 70,000 stands out in my head, but I, I'm not makes, entirely sure. That sounds about what I would expect. Yeah, building lot, 20 acres, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's no improvements on the building lot, guys. No. So right. it's not right. a real building right. lot. No, it's actually just a, yeah, it's just a 70 lot. sounds high to me. Yeah. Let's see here. No, that's not it. Uh, Cliff will have it in a second. <laughs> no ethereal map. I mean, it kind I'm of goes sure to it the, matters. It kind of, well, kind of goes to the question of, you know, what due diligence is required of the new owner, in this case, the East Randolph Baptist Church, to 
document that they've reached out to if they sell it five years from now for seventy thousand dollars to a non-youth i'm just putting this out there a non-youth oriented organization claiming that they haven't been able to find a youth organization to purchase it i mean what what do we have to hold their you know hold them accountable well, for that that's why we want the 75 percent little clause there well, right I, I, but I, you I would that if the they sold it to somebody, then you would have to challenge it first off. Right. And that's at the time you would then ask them to show what they did for outreach. The same as somebody, if we had sold it to somebody and not kept it for youth, we could have been challenged also. And then we would have had to produce. Sure. Okay. You know, if we sold it to Perry to build a tent business on today, we would have to prove probably to this group why we felt that we hadn't, you know, why we felt they shouldn't have gotten it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So right, right. I, I think we've done it. And I think I don't see them ever getting rid of this to tell you the truth with what they do. But, you know, yeah. if they do, then first off, somebody's got to challenge it. So I imagine it's by filing in the court to, to challenge the deed. I have a, D, a um, homestead value of fifty thousand two hundred dollars. More than I'd pay for it, but no, yeah, that's <laughs> that's very high for the lot for what it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what's on that's what's assessed on the bill too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Cliff. Well, somebody want to put forward a motion? Well, Trini started one. Yeah. Make a motion that we authorize Adolfo to complete the transfer with the changes discussed on the deed and adding the condition that if it's sold in 10 years, the town gets 75% of the net proceeds. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay, the motion passes. So just said I'm, I'm, I'm just took notes here for the motion authorize Adolfo to complete transfer with restrictions on on deed and 75% of sale if sold within 10 years. Of the net proceeds from the sale. Okay. Okay. Done. I got it. Thank you. Okay, so our next item on the agenda is tax sale and property acquisition. So uh, Cliff and I have been uh, discussing a number of different issues related to this and they really have spurred from one of the properties that we had in Randolph um, on tax sale for a number of years since before I arrived um, in this property. Uh, Cliff, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's it was 13 Park Street. Uh, and it was a property fairly close to the park between potentially the village fire station and the park. Um, and that property had remained on property tax sale for a number of years because the owner had passed away um, and the trust had just no money to pay for it. So we had been approached by a number of different people that wanted to buy the property, but um, we're expecting the town to abate the fees and we, we could not do that. So the property just remained on, on the tax rolls, tax rolls and became the liability of the town. We eventually were able to find a way to get rid of the property and it has since been removed. It was, it was a blighted property. It's, it was torn down. Now there's a tiny house there. Somebody purchased it and it's, it's um, now making generating revenue for the town tax revenue. So taking the lesson learned there, uh, and then also trying to apply it to other lots in the town, Cliff um, came up with a strategy to to more quickly bring blighted properties back on to become a an asset to the, to the taxpayers. So I'll, I'll hand it off to Cliff. Yeah, I think that um, you know. 
I know last year we had a property that went to tax sale and, and it was not bid on. And it's if the if the town bids the minimum bid on on a property that's not getting it, they're really not out of any money because we're not we don't have the tax revenue and it, there's nothing to hold their feet to the fire to pay. Um, and then after a year, if we took possession of those properties, um, we would turn around, put them right back on the market with a sealed bid requirement and a minimum bid um, to, to get back our money and any excess proceeds above what our investment was would go back to the original owner. Uh, that's, that's settled case law. Um, so it's, um, I'm concerned that if we, if, ta if properties don't receive a minimum bid at tax sale, um, it's really, people aren't paying the taxes anyway, and they will continue to accumulate, creating a, a barrier like what we had at Park Street. Um, and, and we won't, we won't ever get our money out of it, the tax money out of it, and it places a burden on the, on the other taxpayers in town. So what we're um, asking for is for the select board to approve minimum bidding criteria for some of these properties that don't get a minimum bid um, so that we could potentially take possession of them after a year and turn around and sell them to get the tax dollars and put them put the properties back on the tax rolls with somebody that'll pay the taxes. So Cliff, uh, if I go to a tax sale and I bid on a property, I pay for it, that money goes into an account and the individual who owned it has a year to basically pay me back, right? That so is I correct. thought, so if I'm a private person and I bid on that and then I turn around and sell it, I don't have to pay the guy a penny of what I sell it for. Why does the town have to? Um, because the town is, is not allowed to enrich itself at the expense of their taxpayers. And we do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, private, <laughs> private citizens can do it, but the town cannot. That's the nature of taxation, isn't it? Sort of. <laughs> that, that, that was, uh, that was that, <laughs> there was a case on point about, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago that the Vermont Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. You have to um, you can only take your taxes, interest, penalties, and fees out of the proceeds, and the balance has to go back to that taxpayer that you took the property from. And what, Cliff, wouldn't it be that way, whether the way we do it now or if we change the policy of a, to a minimum bid, we still have to give the owner the extra, right? Not, I'm not completely understanding your question, Pat. Right now, if, if we sell it for more than is owed on it, we have uh, to give the extra money back to the owner still. Yes. This yes, wouldn't change. yes. Anything above what we, um, we had a situation last year where somebody paid more than the minimum. We hold that in escrow. Right. Um, and they, if the original if the person who bought the tax lien ends up with the property, the property owner gets that excess, the, 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 the original property owner. Right, so there wouldn't be any change in that anyway. That is correct. We, um, we, only, get, we only get the money that we would have gotten if they, they had paid their, if they had redeemed it. So what happens if we turn around and go to sell this and nobody wants it? I can think of at least one property that that's probably going to be the case. Are we well, then obligated to clean it up? Probably if we want to get rid of it, yes. Um, it's a possible, that is a possibility training. And the, the issue is that the taxes will continue to accrue on the property if we don't do that. Um, and we don't have an opportunity to put it back out on the tax rolls. And we also probably wouldn't have an, an opportunity like we did at Park Street um, with the right process in place to abate those taxes. 
And I guess it would still on a the burden over time to, to the other taxpayers in town. So it's still on the tax rolls. It's just we would get paid for it. Um, right. If if we if we owned it, we would not. Yeah, it would still be on the tax rolls, but we would not be collecting taxes because we would own it. Right, but if we didn't buy it, it would still be accruing taxes. We just wouldn't get paid for them. That is correct. Yeah. So the longer it is on the tax roll, the the higher the liability is climbing. Um, and so if this year it's a thousand dollars, and next year it'll be another thousand. Well, but if we, the town, acquired it at a thousand dollars, then we could turn around and sell it for a thousand one dollars. But if the town just allows it to sit, it's still gen generating on paper, generating revenue for the town because it's it's still owed the tax money. But every year that tax liability is growing, and if the town had the ability to sell it at a thousand as opposed to ten years down the road for ten thousand, it would be easier to sell right off the top for the thousand dollars so does the list of properties that you believe this is going to happen to come to the select board to approve that minimum bid before the tax sale we, we can um i'd have to double check uh with cliff the the scheduled tax um let me be more specific for the record we'd have to double check with the town's delinquent tax collector which happens to be cliff on when the the tax sale is, is scheduled for, and we do have a meeting, a special meeting of the select board next week slash hearing. So we could potentially present that list to the select board at that meeting. My only concern would be that we place a minimum bid on a property that has hazmat and all kinds of other stuff on it. And we end up so upside down in the property that we can't get out from under it. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. That's why I think it's good to have a list and some type of due diligence done on them before we, you know, what's our exposure. There's one over in East Randolph on the Chelsea Mountain Road that's down over the bank that is going to cost somebody a fortune to clean up. That's probably the one I'm thinking of um, training. <laughs> well, it's not anything the town wants, trust me. Body. Yes. You said naughty, Pat. Yeah. That's the one. Is that the one we're not gonna we're not gonna do anything with? Oh, I I would adamantly vote against it. Knowing what was there mystery? and what happened there. Ooh. I grew up right down the road from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably got some problems for sure. Is that where yep. you had all your parties? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was nope. somewhere else. We didn't want to glow when we walked out of there. We wanted to be able to sneak back in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I noticed that the language uh, under recommended or required action does reference very specific properties. Um, yeah. do, do, does that address Trini's concern? Um, in other words, will this will the select board have purview over those properties that we designate our authorized agent to submit a minimum bid on or do we delegate to the authorized agent that decision making i'm not clear you can certainly authorize specific properties tom i, I do have a tax sale list that's current um, that i can get out to you guys between now and i'll get it out after the meeting um, it's the list that's being published in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably in today's paper, actually. 
um, but I will I will forward you the list that's posted on the front of front of town hall. Okay. I would certainly want to say that you know we should be selective in this process. Absolutely. I don't feel that um, we should be just you know picking up everything that happens this way. I'd much rather look into this because I can only think of some situations that happened years ago where you know there were certain things that happened on certain properties and then all of a sudden you know there were issues and couldn't transfer title and those kind of things and so um, I think we should have the the right to do our due diligence and be somewhat selective. Mm -hmm. I think the select board should make the final decision on which yeah, one I, is going to minimum bid. Yeah, I would agree. I would also. I like the concept of it. So with some of those thoughts, I think, you know, this would certainly be a way to move those properties along a little faster. So. Yeah. Is someone willing to make a motion to that effect? Before you get to the motion, I also just want to add that um, the designated agent for the select board, we're, I would suggest it being a select board member. I can't do it as delinquent tax collector. I think it's a big conflict of interest. Um, I think the town manager being uh, the person that I report to is also a conflict of interest. Um, and so I think that the um, next logical place is to have a member of the select board um, be the one that actually bids on the prop any properties that are approved. That makes sense, Cliff. I'd like a good job for the chair. That's <laughs> what I was just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> she knows all the properties from her youth. Yes, she does. Not all of them, Pat. Oh, not close enough. Just the shady ones. Huh? <laughs> the ones not to party on. <laughs> so what's the motion look like here? I'm trying yeah. to find a memo here. Uh, could we simply insert... It says authorize the purchase of tax liens on very specific properties with select board approval uh, in Randolph with select board approval that was listed for sale through the delinquent tax or utility fee process and designate the select board chair as authorized agent to represent the town during the tax sale process and put forth a minimum bid if and only if the alternative minimum bid is not received. Does that capture? That sounds like a motion to me. I will make that a motion if that <laughs> captures everything we've just agreed to. And Trini, as the current uh, chair, is amenable to being our authorized agent. <laughs> I'll second that. OK. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. Cool. Thank you. What I like about that motion is that I could cut and paste. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the editor in me. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to surplus allocation. Uh, we, uh, Cliff mostly has been uh, very focused on closing our books for FY20. Um, as you all probably already know, we are in a much better place in terms of being able to determine how much money is available, how much money is uh, or was ex expended in the previous fiscal year. Um, and so over the last several months, we've had a very good idea of where we would end fiscal year 20. Uh, and now that we have essentially the 60 day period of, of allocating bills to the previous fiscal years passed, uh, Cliff now has a very good, if not much more accurate understanding of where we are. And so we were hoping to um, bring a topic of discussion to you and uh, Cliff, go ahead. Um, I've been probably since May, I've been projecting um, a 
couple of, a, a surplus in the general fund and hoping we could break even in the highway fund. Um, now that we're, like Adolfo said, past that 60 day rule, um, those projections have held. In fact, we've done, we're, we've got a very sizable surplus in the general fund of um, somewhere around $325,000. Um, and in the highway, we've got a modest um, of approximately $10,000. Um, those surpluses have traditionally been allocated into the reserve funds. And at last town meeting, we did not have those articles on the ballot um, because we overlooked them. And so now we have the opportunity to go back to the voters and take care of this in November um, with a special vote. Um, and so I think you've got two um, things in your packet. One is a, an allocation of this, a proposed allocation of the, a fiscal year surplus spreadsheet. Um, and the other is a proposed warning for the November 3rd election. And it would have to be a paper ballot. Um, it may be easier to see um, what I'm proposing by looking at the, the proposed, the draft warning um, and allocating some to five different reserve funds for the general fund um, to bolster those reserves a bit um, and then taking the entire surplus from the highway fund and putting it into the paving reserve. The bulk of the uh, general fund surplus I'm proposing go to the highway paving reserve fund. We've got quite a bit of paving um, that could be done in Randolph if we had the money. Um, and then as we move down the list, facilities reserve would get 50,000. Um, the gravel road reserve would get 40. The highway equipment reserve would get 25 and we were planning on putting three into the recreation reserve with the balance going to the highway paving fund, if you all agree. So Cliff, right now the recreation reserve is negative? Uh, that is correct, Larry. That was a conscious decision because of the repainting of the pool. Um, and so we use the appropriation from the current fiscal year that we're in, fiscal 21, um, we went negative knowing full well we were going to get the, the approach. We had the appropriation already approved um, to do that project. Um, it seems like it would make sense to at least zero that out, no? It zeroed out on the first day of the year on July 1. So then, what will so then what will the reserve look like on July one? It'll have three thousand dollars in it. It'll have three thousand dollars if the voters approve it. So the so the negative amount goes away. I guess I don't understand how that accounting works. The the negative goes away on July one with the with the new fiscal year appropriation. Pending approval of the voters. So no, yeah. no, the voters have already approved that transfer. Oh, time. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, right. so the so what you're saying is that the, the 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 current budget that we've already approved for next year will will make that reserve whole. That's what you're saying for this year. It's this, this year's budget. Yeah. 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 For this year. That's right. Yes. I'm sorry. For this year's budget. Okay. It's almost half over. <laughs> right, right, right. We knew when we authorized the painting of the pool that we were tapping into this current year's budget to pay for it. Right. This is just the accounting to catch up to it. So what... Um... So what do you think that paving number is going to look like? Because we've got some residents on Fish Hill that are needing some attention. They've sent a petition in. Um, so is there, 
Is there going to be kind of money in there to take care of some of those problems? Depends on how much those problems cost, Perry. I get but, that part. I understand that. But, but, but the number, the approximate number is about 200K. Okay. We have asked um, Morgan, or I have asked Morgan to speak with some of our local, some of the pavers that have done some of the more successful projects in town. Um, the one that comes to mind is, is um, uh, Pike, because they did a fairly decent job on Furnace Street and then also on Windover Road. So we've asked, uh, I've asked Morgan to reach out to them specifically and then also others to see what they would charge for maybe just uh, you know, some of the, the lightest work that they can. So it would, it would hold up for at least a decade or hopefully a decade, but also not be too expensive so we can do maybe one road, two roads and be able to work it out over the next few years. So we don't have a cost yet, uh, but Morgan is working on on obtaining amounts to present to the board. I have a question about the paper ballot. Uh, presumably this will be distributed by the town clerk um, along with all of the ballots that are being mailed out for the national and state and local elections. Is that accurate? I don't believe that's accurate, Tom. Um, the, the vote needs to be warned and this vote cannot be warned before, it has to be warned within 40 days of the meeting. Okay. But we're 40, so we're, we're, within 40. we're well, we're well, oh, it has to be warned only 40 days in advance. It can't be warned this far out. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I believe that, I believe that's the case. Okay, so well, that means maybe. that only people that are willing to vote in person on November 3rd can vote on this. Am I correct? No, that doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Because we vote all the stuff for town meeting by absentee ballot. Right. And that's, that's generally where this would have been. I got to believe if it gets warned within, I think it's within 40 days of the vote. Yeah. yeah. So, then, so then people would have to request this as an absentee ballot, independent of getting their mail-in ballot for the presidential and statewide election. Well, I think Part of the sorry, challenge here, that. Tom, is that the Secretary of State is stepping in and mailing out a lot of those ballots. Right. So it just so, it would be hard to tell who's gonna who's gonna send it in and who's gonna attend in person. I think that's where your challenge for this one is. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to get clear on on on, on making this ballot as accessible. In in the case of our presidential and state ballots, we've received postcards from the town clerk's office that entitled us, that, that asked us to ask for mail-in ballots for both the most recent primary election and for the general election. And you could check off a box that said you wanted mail-in ballots for both. Okay. So, but didn't, so. They came from the Secretary of State, but didn't I understand Joyce to say that um, for the election in November that the Secretary of State is actually mailing the ballots out to everybody? Yes, that's correct. Statewide. Okay. So our problem would be that this would be, I mean, we could do it as long as we mailed the ballot to every, every registered voter. If it's helpful, and I normally would not, yeah, yeah, it would be, um, but if it's helpful, and I normally would not suggest this, um, but given the circumstances that the board is going to meet again very soon and next week, um, in that short time span, uh, both Cliff and I can can speak with Joyce. We could potentially ask her to research uh, ways to make this topic available to everyone for a vote. And at the next meeting, before the next meeting, we could email to the board as part of their packet the information compiled by Joyce, and then at the meeting next Thursday, uh, the board can then decide on, on a ballot question or 
at the very least, make a decision based on updated information that we were able to get from the clerk, who may also get additional information from the Secretary of State. And we don't want to make it confusing for the voters. It's, so already, already, I'm, it's I'm already, already confusing enough. Yeah, I'm already uh, confused. What's yeah. the difference between this and, and you know, somebody doesn't want to personally go to town hall to vote. Why can't they just request an absentee ballot? Well, that's what, what's that, the problem? Yeah, no, I'm not saying what we normally I'm not suggesting do. there is a problem. That's what I just want to make sure what the process is. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the, always been the standard procedure. If you couldn't attend and you were out of town or whatever, yeah. you just request your absentee ballot, you fill yeah. it out, you return it, and you're good to go. Yeah, yeah, that seems fine to and me. That's easy for this. I mean, this is this should be pretty simple. Yeah. So, but chat that's with Joyce about it. See what she thinks. I think the problem is they're getting all the other ballots from the Secretary of State, so they aren't going to necessarily know that they'd have to request some others separately. But is it our job to make them aware of that if we notify this the way we're supposed to notify it? I mean, if we publish a notice, it's in the paper, special town meeting to, art, to board on this article, and you put it in the paper and you publicize it the way you should be publicizing it, um, why are we obligated to, we don't mail everybody a ballot when we have no, a town no, meeting. No. And I'm not suggesting that we should. I just want to make sure that people are clear on what the process is, because if they're yeah. expecting to get mail-in ballots, then it makes sense that they would have that same expectation of this ballot, but I'm fine with it being an absentee process. I just feel like we've got some work to do to make the voters aware of that. Um, It'd be interesting well, to yes. by the Secretary of State, there may be a deadline by which you have to have ballots to them to send out. So you may not be able to do it separately. I don't yeah. know. Next question then, is there an urgency to do this in November or do we, could we schedule it for December? That's less confusing. Or March. Yeah, is there any reason why we can't just do it at town meeting next March? Um, it holds the books open and doesn't give us um, access right. to that room. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Totally get it. That's All what right. I was afraid well, of. We, but we want you to close your books. The townspeople haven't told us what to do with it. I see. Okay. <laughs> What, how do we normally deal with this? I don't recall us having this issue before. We, it's not the first time we have some sort of a surplus that we need to figure out, right? Yeah, previous it's surplus. usually on the ballots. Yeah, and we, I, I, I'll say I goofed and I didn't put um, this question that we normally have on previous books or previous ballots in last year's ballot. Um, and so now, you know, uh, it, it gives us the opportunity to break it out because we know what the amount of money is whereas before the previous process was any surplus that we have goes into this fund I see. so in, in some ways the process that's happening now albeit it's a little confusing because of the timeline and working with joyce for now so the first one's always a little more confusing uh, it seems like this may actually be a more efficient process because it allows the uh, finance director and the town manager to know how much surplus will be left and how to better allocate that surplus, whereas the old process was any surplus that is available goes into this fund. Um, so this is much more efficient and more targeted. And I think if the board chose to go through this process next year, it would be more like clockwork and, and the finance director, the town manager will know how much is left and how much of that surplus can be moved around. It gives a, the board more control over where to move the surplus. Got it. All right, that seems like a reasonable way to move it. So, okay. Can I ask two questions about the allocation, Larry? Please go ahead, Todd. Um, one is gravel reserve. Should we be putting more than the 40,000 in? I know several of the back roads are needing gravel. Is the 85,000 enough? Do all the back roads we need to do? Uh, simple, qu simple question, simple answer, no. 
there's there's you know i'll just be honest there's never enough um but i think that the challenge is that we we, we there's a limited amount in distributing we're trying to distribute it as best as possible and um you know although there's never enough i think the, the paving project typically costs a lot more than the gravel projects how much would 85,000, how many miles of gravel road would that allow us to do? Uh, I would have to speak specifically with, with Morgan, but it seems like Cliff maybe has a response. Yeah, I think, I think maybe about five miles, Pat, putting three inches down. My other question is people over in the East Valley have been working very hard on uh, doing something with the building, with the 50,000 going into the facilities reserve, allow us to do something this next year on that building? I was wondering that as well. It, 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 there are, you know, and I don't mean to disparage the work that the East Valley Community Group is doing. And I think the challenge that, that I feel the town has kind of laid out for them is to fundraise as much of it as possible because we do have buildings that are used much more often that are in, in, in great need of, of, of help. Uh, granted, that's only the recommendation that we would make to the board if the board said no, X amount needs to go to this project, that, that's what we would do, the town manager and, and finance director. But um, I think allocating any large amount to that particular project um, would put other buildings at potential risk. I, I think they're, they're just, there are other challenges uh, that should be addressed. Well, you've got 60,000 in a couple of years for two years in a row. Wouldn't it be possible to move some of that up so they could start making progress? Well, the, cha the challenge is that one of our highway garages is, is we'll need a new roof, either a whole new roof or a big section of a roof. And, um, and I'm talking about the, the Randolph Center garage, and that's, that's a very large building. Um, uh, that's just one of the projects for, for facilities. Um, the Randolph Pool House building has been in the pipeline since at least since I started. And has taken a back seat because of the repairs to the swimming pool. Um, we, you know, it has, as far as I can see, it has not physically leaked the skylight here in Randolph Town Hall, but the paint around it looks like it's seen better days um, and Town Hall is used every day. Um, Isn't that part of the Capital Budget Committee's job? Yeah. To look at what we have for funding and decide which projects should be coming forward. So maybe this isn't, I mean, we're not going to solve this tonight. No. I think we're getting into the weeds. The what projects come forward to go in the budget, that group is supposed to be looking at all the needs and prioritizing them. Yep. And to uh, Trini's point, we did also just send to all directors. Uh, a blank spread, uh, spreadsheet to make it more inclusive uh, with a project that Cliff has been working on with some of the directors. Um, we sent them a spreadsheet to say, fill it out with every capital need that your committee is going to have. So once we receive those spreadsheets, we'll know exactly what some of the major issues are um, more directly from the managers than what the previous process was, which, which was less inclusive of their thoughts. Well, with what you said, Trini, if it really is developed in the Capital Budgets Committee, I'm satisfied with that because I'm uh, representative to that. But it didn't happen last year. So. Given that it does seem to be the responsibility of that committee, I'd like to say that it, it would be nice for us to at least allocate some money to the East Valley Group so that they could, you know, at least be eligible for some sorts of, you know, matching grants. You know, it'd be nice for them to, for us to be able to say to them, well, if you find twenty thousand dollars and you need a twenty thousand dollar match, that you know, we could do that. Um, you know, for these other projects, we're we're not going to typically see that. We're just going to have to, you know, put a new roof on that building and do it. But 
seems like it'd be a shame to turn away the opportunities to get some grant money. If I may make a suggestion, I think that the select board has, has um, really created the atmosphere of working from the committees upward. And then the select board will see what the committee members have decided, essentially empowering them to make their decisions, look at what's available. And then if any tweaking needs to happen, the select board then can make changes. Uh, if in, the, if, if in the, the process that we have where the capital committee and other committees review what's out there, listen to directors, listen to projects that are available, and then they can make the, the, a general allotment of where money is going. And then once that makes its way up to the select board, the select board can then say, okay, we appreciate what this committee did, but let's take a little from here and a little from there and put it towards potentially the East Randolph Hall. So that this way the committees are still empowered to do their work and the select board then can then take some of their work and then move, make suggestions as opposed to telling the committees what to do. Adolfo, when, uh, when the East Valley group has come in with their grants to date, we've provided the match for those, correct? We have. And yes, wouldn't have. this be the pot of money that we would tag for some of that? If it they would came be in with a grant that say 20,000 and they needed 20% or a 50-50 match, if the board accepted, this would be the pot of money we would go to, right? That's right. It would typically come out of the facilities reserve. I guess I'm, uh, I feel like we've encouraged them to go after grants and to, you know, come to us to let us know they're coming where we could make the evaluation of if we had the funding. I'd rather earmark it then than earmark it today and not have it if we needed it for something else. Yeah. So you're saying, Trini, as they come up with uh, something that needs matching, that that would come to the select board to be approved at that point? Uh, the process for grants hasn't changed. When somebody wants to apply for a grant that the town of Randolph is gonna have to be the applicant, they come to the board to get approval to apply and then they come to the board to get approval to accept. Right. So I we know that. what we're committing for match funding when we allow an application to go in. Right. So that would be at the same time. And even and to add to that, um, even there, there, there have been projects that have had money appropriated to them in the capital plan spreadsheet, but um, because it is a plan spreadsheet as opposed to a voter approved budget. So with the budget, the town could only spend money for that specific line item for that specific issue. In the capital plan, it's a plan that's fluid. And even if the select board or the capital committee puts aside 50,000, say for example, to purchase a truck in the next 10 years, the select board can say this priority project came up. We need to use this specific pot of money, which is in this reserve fund. We can push that truck purchase out another year or two to use some of the money that had been allocated for it. So to Trini's point, it's all still very fluid. And even if something is put in the capital plan, it doesn't set it in stone. It's just essentially a placeholder that can be pushed out a year or two later, depending on what emergency projects come up. Okay, I'd just like to go on record. I'm gonna also support them getting some money to make some progress over there. So we don't lose their contributions. So I think it sounds like at this point, the board was interested in potentially holding off on a decision on, on allocating the surplus until we had a question answered by the clerk potentially next week on how the voting process is going to be handled. Sounds right. Okay. Yeah. Cliff, so would that work with, um, with your timeline? It still gives us 40 days until, right? Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that'll work fine. 
So we'll discuss this. And, and I'm not I'm not 100 percent certain of the the timeline with the clerk, but I know that 40 days was out there. So I think it's between 30 and 40 or 45. Minimum of 30, maximum of 40 or 45. Okay, so we'll discuss this again next week. I'll make sure it gets put back on the agenda. Great. So let's move on to the water wastewater community membership. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Cliff. Um, we have had there. There is a member of the water wastewater committee that has um, not responded to messages that I've sent to him. Um, and my messages to him had been essentially an inquiry on whether he is choosing to remain on the committee. Um, uh, this person, uh, the committee member is Dave Farnham. And so I, I have not spoken with him. I have not been able to communicate with him. He has not communicated with me. And I think at this point, um, what I was hoping that the board would entertain is a, a, um, a motion to remove Mr. Dave Farnham from the water wastewater committee. So moved. Second. Second. Has he missed a bunch of meetings? Um, it's it's more of a lack of communication. I, I think when previous meetings had been held, um, and Larry Larry Larry's the chair of the committee, um, and I don't recall when the last committee meeting was held, um, but just a lack of communication with me uh, makes me feel uncomfortable that there's already, that there, could, there could be not the engagement there that needs to be there. Can, can you speak to that, Larry? Uh, the Water and Wastewater Committee has not met in several months. There hasn't been a, a it, that committee doesn't meet on a regular basis, sort of meets as necessary. And it's been a while since we've met. Um, my recollection is that he was at the last meeting. I'm, I, I'd have to check the minutes to be sure. Mm -hmm. I know there is precedence in the past where, um, and most recently during my tenure as town manager, where the select board has voted to remove a person from the appointment, uh, from their appointment, and uh, and I would urge the board to take up the motion and the second that has been made on, on the request that I've made to the board. Move the question. Yeah, we have a, we have a motion in a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Was that a five zero? I, I heard um, I, I heard Trini and, and, and Perry and Larry and Tom. Pat, did you vote? Uh, or did I voted you choose yes. to abstain? I voted yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, that moves us on to grants. No grants. Um, and also no, no other items other than, uh, up until the manager's report. Okay, manager. <laughs> um, uh, I'll keep it very brief. Um, just want to remind the select board or share an update that um, we have we have sent out notices for the CDBG grants that um, uh, the board had previously approved for us to apply for, uh, including the coronavirus grant and then also a grant for the water wastewater system. Uh, we are working with uh, Julian RACDC for the CDBG CV gr uh, grant, so we're working very closely with her on that. Uh, a household hazardous waste event is coming up. Um, the next event is in Northfield on the 19th. That event is open to everyone uh, within the Mountain Alliance, including Randolph. Uh, I've shared with the board an update on my uh, research into the sign ordinance, specifically on the banner issue. Um, it looks like there is more that needs to be looked into as far as the banner process. So I will, as soon as it comes up, I will share more with it with the select board. The sale of 45 South Main Street is moving along. Uh, we had the fire marshal perform a uh, change of ownership inspection and 
uh, there were a few minor things, mostly on um, batteries for the existing fire smoke detectors in the building, but that uh, sale process is moving along smoothly. Uh, we have a proposed policy that Cliff and I had been working on, mostly Cliff doing the yeoman's work on it, is a, a comp time policy for managers. Um, we want to make sure that managers are that, that do work more, more than 40 hours a week have an ability to um, have the time that they need to, to remain effective at their job. So we hope to have a draft to the board in the next uh, few meetings. Uh, and then also just wanted to share with the board um, that I will soon start to uh, pull together the recruitment materials for my successor. Uh, those materials will, will include previous announcements for my position as well as um, uh, included information from VLCT and uh, not necessarily use VLCT as a recruiter but just um, any updated information that they have, uh, any recruitment that they've used in the past and what language would, would be suited for, for a recruitment uh, document. So I will start on that very soon. Um, and that's it, that's, that's what I have. Oh, uh, one, one other thing is um, that it may be useful in the recruitment process to um, pull together a, a potential committee that includes um, members of the community um, you know, just some things that have come up over the last few days. It could be uh, maybe the uh, executive director of Gifford, uh, the school district superintendent, uh, Bob Haynes from Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation, maybe a representative from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, um, the agencies that have worked with the town with the successes that we've had just to make sure that they continue moving forward. So, um, but I'll bring more information to the board as, as I pull it together for consideration. And that's it. That's what I have uh, for the manager's report. Okay. So are we done, folks? Like we're there, huh? Yes, we are. I move that we adjourn. Second. Second. Yeah. <laughs> all, all in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Good night, everyone. Good Thank night. you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Larry. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Nice job, Larry. Thanks, all, folks. <laughs> bye, bye bye. See y'all later.